So, on my last trip to the home box store, trying to pick out a brush for some finishing I need to do, I noticed that there's about a million different types of brushes that you can choose from. Well, that could get a little confusing. So I thought, maybe I should ask my good friend Brian Miller, who is probably the best in the business on finishing, to do a video explaining the different type of brushes and how to properly use it. I hope you find this video helpful. Hi, I'm Brian Miller, professional wood finisher. Today we're at William Ng's School of Woodworking and we're here to talk about brushes. Nylon versus natural bristle brushes. So what's the difference and what are they used for? Well, here we go. This particular brush is a combination of both ox hair and Chinese bristle. Um, a good quality brush can be gauged by the length of the bristles and you can see they're all cut at different lengths. Also, if you were to look at this under a microscope, you would see that the end of the bristles have split ends. Now, for your hair, that's not a good thing, but for a paintbrush like this, it is. Uh, it holds more material. This type of brush is a brush that I use almost on a daily basis. It is a brush that you would want to use for both oil-based paints, oil-based stains, and oil-based varnishes. This brush is also Chinese bristle, it would normally be black. They've dyed the bristles white. And this particular brush, uh, they're also cut at different lengths and they're also flagged at the end. What I like this brush for in particular, it's a little stiffer bristle. I prefer this brush for using things like shellac. It holds its shape all day long to, and at the end of the day, it's an easier brush to keep clean and hold its shape. This brush is made by a company in New York. It's uh, called Gramercy Tools. This brush is pure ox hair. They set numerous rows of bristles. These are all handmade. This is a great, great tool for doing varnish work. It holds a tremendous amount of material because of the amount of rows of bristles. And one thing you'll notice on the two brushes I've showed you before this one is the handles are unfinished. There's no clear lacquer. There's no bright red paint or uh, black gloss paint. The reason being is when you wash a brush in a strong solvent like lacquer thinner or acetone, that clear finish is going to dissolve and get everywhere onto the bristles. You don't want that. So a better quality brush is going to be left unfinished like this. So either one of these three brushes is what you would want to use for an oil-based paint, an oil-based stain, an oil-based varnish. This brush is an imitation. It's not a pure badger hair brush, uh, but what they've done is it's, they use skunk hair to imitate it. Um, a lot of guys prefer this. It's a little stiffer bristle. A lot of professionals prefer this for doing varnish work. I'll leave that up to you if you want to try it. You're going to spend a fair amount of money for a good quality brush. Anyone, this brush is going to run probably $30 or more. This is going to run in the $20 range. This is about $15. Spend money on a good tool. Your tools are what's going to make or break your project. A better quality brush also is going to use uh, an adhesive, the glue that they put this into, into this is called the ferrule, where the bristles get set into. And you, the last thing you want to do is be picking bristles out of your finish, which is problematic with really inexpensive brushes like these. These are good for maybe using for glue uh, or doing sample pieces, but I would never use something like this uh, on a daily basis. When you're talking water-based paints, water-based stains and water-based finishes, you don't want to use pure animal hair brushes in water-based paint. What it's going to do is dry out these bristles, and maybe you've seen a brush where it gets like this, and that's from taking a pure bristle brush, natural animal hair, and putting it into water-based finishes. In that case, you're better off using a brush that, in this case, is a blend of uh, both nylon and polyester synthetic fibers. Again, like the bristle brushes, the bristles are cut at different lengths. They also split the ends of these as well. Uh, unfinished handle. This is a great brush for using, like I say, water-based paints, water-based clear coats, water-based stains. Some people nowadays prefer an angular cut brush. 
and it doesn't matter the manufacturer. Personally, I'm not a big fan of them. You can only, when you use this brush, you're bending the bristles one way and one way only. Eventually, they start to wear and they start to bend just that way. When you have a straight cut brush, I'll use it this way, and then I'll turn it over and use it this way. So I'm constantly bending the bristles one way, the other way, and by the end of the day, they're straight. I've had this brush for about a year now, and you can see there's no excess paint in here or clear finish. Here we have an angular cut nylon brush. When I was a young apprentice, I showed up at the job site one day, and I worked for a contractor, a painting contractor, whose retired father was also a painter, and he would come out and help us occasionally on really high quality, high end projects that we'd be doing in the Beverly Hills area. So I showed up with an angular cut brush and he asked me, he goes, what the hell is that thing? And I said, oh, it's a sash brush for cutting window sash. And he goes, look kid, let me tell you something. If you can't cut a straight line with a straight cut brush, don't even call yourself a painter. Get that off my job site. So I took the brush back to my truck, put it in my toolbox with my tail between my legs, but after several years of experience, he was really right. You should be able to cut a straight line with a straight cut brush like this. Now we're ready to actually apply some finish. We have a recess panel oak door. We applied color to it, and this particular coloring method was iron acetate that you may have seen in a previous video. Instead of spraying a clear coat of lacquer on it, we are going to brush apply, since we're talking brushes today, a coat of oil base polyurethane varnish. Now some of you out there may not know what that is exactly. So what is it? You have a resin, in this case a urethane resin. They heat that resin up, they introduce it to an oil like boiled linseed oil, which is a drying oil. Then they add, say, paint thinner to it, mineral spirits, and they add some other things, some metallic dryers to help make it dry. So the difference between a urethane, polyurethane varnish, and this particular varnish, a different manufacturer. This one is made by the Bona Company, B-O-N-A. It's called an oil-modified polyurethane varnish. It, the sheen level is gloss. This one is an oil-based varnish as well. The difference being this has an alkyd resin. They also heat it up, introduce it to an oil like boiled linseed oil, add a carrier like mineral spirits paint thinner. They also add dryers to that. Of these two types of varnishes, the urethane varnish is going to get, offer a little more protection than the standard alkyd varnish. The urethane resin tends to hold up better to both moisture, heat, and abrasion. This is what I decided to apply in my own kitchen cabinets when I redid my kitchen about seven years ago now. That finish has held up very well for seven years, both under the sink and next to the stove where it gets a lot of use. We're ready to start brushing our door. What we have is some of that Bona oil modified polyurethane varnish that we've strained into a clean cup. We're going to use our pure bristle brush that's a combination of both ox hair and Chinese bristle. When you hold the brush, I've seen some of you people out there and you look like a lobster holding a, a you know, it's, it's prey. Hold the brush like this. Put three fingers on the back side of it. Your index finger is going to go on this cutout section here, and your thumb is going to be on the back side of it. When you dip it in, only dip it in about that far. You can see the, how the bristles are wet. They absorb the finish. Most of the time I've seen people that don't have a lot of experience, the first thing that they want to do is wipe that off against the edge. Well, the problem with doing that is now you've taken all that material that was loaded on that part of the useful part of the bristles and wiped it off. So dip it in, tap it against the side, turn it around, tap it again. Now the brush is fully loaded with material and we're ready to brush. In a case like this with this recessed panel door, I'm gonna start from the panel and work my way out towards the edges. You don't want to start right in the corner because it is full of material. So I'm going to start away from the corner a little bit, brush it back and forth, and actually bend the bristles and push it into place like so. I'll take it across here and across here. Now we're going to do something called laying off the finish. You go up and back, up and back, leave it alone. You've covered that area 100%. It's time to move on to the next section. 
Same thing, dip it in, tap it on both sides, start it away from your edges while it's full of material. And lay it off. Often I see people that don't have a lot of experience with a brush, they want to do real choppy strokes like this. You want longer strokes. There again. And I'm not afraid to actually bend these bristles and make it conform to the corners. Lay it off, lay it off, leave it alone. Now we're ready to start taking it to the outside. Dip it again. And I'm going to start here and actually just, you can see I'm just pushing a little bit of the bristles down onto that molding detail. Back and forth, leave it alone. And now I want to do this edge next right here. I'm going to do that all in one stroke. You may have gotten a little bit of finish that wrapped around to the back side of the door. If you don't wipe that off, you're going to have a big fat edge of dried material. And when you turn the door over after it's dry, you're going to see that I have a big edge of material. Now I need to deal with that either by taking a razor knife or trying to sand it off. And if you sand it off, you're going to sand your color out. So you don't want to do that. We've done the edge. Now let's just take it on the top side. Again, I start away from that edge right there because the brush is loaded with material. Look how much I bend those bristles. Don't be afraid. It's not going to hurt the brush. Here's another method you could do. You can take the brush like this and just tap the material onto the surface, go back over it, lay it off, and you're done. If you can take the brush and actually squeeze some of that finish off the bristles onto the edge I want to apply it to. Lay it off, leave it alone. You're done. Wipe that edge again. I don't want to start right here because I don't want the finish rolling down onto that edge that already has finished. So I'll start it away while it's loaded with material. Okay, I have 100% coverage, now I'm just going to lay it off, tip it off. We're done. So the advantage of a polyurethane oil-based varnish, again, is going to be the fact that it stands up better to both heat and water and abrasion than does clear nitrocellulose lacquer. The downside to it is it's a finish that dries slowly. Since it's oil-based, it's going to take at least an hour or two for it to tack off. And what I mean by that, it's going to be wet and sticky. So any airborne particles in your shop or your garage are going to land on it while it's wet. Unlike clear lacquer that you spray apply that dries very, very quickly, airborne particles, when they land on it, land onto a dried surface. This being still wet, when it dries completely overnight and you put your hand over it, it's going to feel a little rough to, the, to your fingers. So you're going to have to lightly sand it, apply a next coat, uh, of your finish again, remove your excess dust, but even on the final coat, it's still never going to feel perfectly smooth. And I'll show you how to rub out a finish like that in a future episode. So we have one very important step left to do today. We did our brush finish on our door. We have a brush to clean though. Now a lot of you are probably groaning right now because you go, I can never get these brushes cleaned properly. Let me show you really simply how to do that. We have three one-gallon buckets here. These first two buckets we're going to put acetone in. The third one we will put paint thinner, which will be our final wash. Now, why do I like to use acetone? Because if you've used this brush all day long, you may have some dried material down towards, this thing is called the ferrule. 
in order to get that dried material loosened up again, uh, paint thinner is not going to re-dissolve it at that point, but acetone surely will because it's a very, very strong solvent. So let's go ahead and put acetone in these two buckets and paint thinner in our final. It doesn't take very much solvent either. So, we've got our setup ready to go. Now, you also want to wear gloves. It's a good idea, and you want to wear gloves that are going to be solvent resistant, that won't just dissolve. Um, you have to remember, your skin is a gateway to your central nervous system. You want to keep solvents like these out of your skin, which will eventually get into your bloodstream and go to all your vital organs. So, let's glove up, shall we? This makes every man over 40 nervous. So let me show you how to properly start cleaning this brush. We're going to tip the bucket because we don't have very much solvent in here. As you can see, I've tipped the bucket and I'm actually pushing that brush at the very bottom of the bucket back and forth, bending the bristles both way because it's a straight cut brush. Now I want to run that solvent back down into the heel of the brush where the material typically is going to want to dry. Let's take a simple wire brush. Gently loosen up any of that dried material that may be there. Do the same thing again. Let it go back down into the heel. Now we're going to take this little handy tool. This is called a brush and roller spinner. As you can see, this is well used. I've had this probably 15 years. You can buy these at most of your paint stores, your big box stores will sell those as well. You push the brush into here and spin out that excess solvent. Now we're ready to go to wash number two and we're gonna do the same thing. Back and forth at the bottom of the bucket putting the material back down into the heel, squeezing it down. And take our wire brush again. Now maybe some of you have seen those brush combs that you can buy, that the tines are spread far apart. Give that to your uncle who has thinning hair. I prefer a wire brush because they're much closer together. Because the bristles are closer together. Run it back down into the heel again. Now we're going to spin out that excess solvent. Our third wash is our paint thinner. This is going to help recondition these bristles a little bit because the paint thinner is a petroleum derivative. Same thing, tip it. Now look how clean it is at the bottom here. Whereas the first two washes that we had have that amber color from the polyurethane varnish itself. At this point, I know the brush is clean. Same thing. I'm going to run it back into the heel. Gently wire brush this. I've probably had this brush for a year at this point. And there's no reason why you can't keep your brushes looking like this yourself. There we have it. Our brush is now clean. Is there a little bit excess paint thinner in here still? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. What I'm going to do next though is put it back into the keeper that it came from. This is important to help keep the shape. Don't throw these away. You can hang this up on a pegboard if you have it. Um, it's a great way to keep the brush always in good condition. 
Last but not least, we have some dirty solvent to deal with here. For me as a professional, I have a 55 gallon drum where all my dirty waste goes into and I generate one to two drums a year depending on my workload. Uh, for you at home though, what are you gonna do with this? You don't wanna pour it into the ground, you don't wanna pour it down the sewer. You can just take this bucket outside, put it in the sun and let it evaporate. That's perfectly legal and acceptable. After you've poured this out, you need to clean your buckets out and you're gonna have a little excess oil on these rags. Do not throw these oily rags into a corner in your shop or garage, or you can have spontaneous combustion occur. So the rags can be left to dry, hang them over a fence, put them into a bucket of water, and you're good to go. I hope you enjoyed this episode.